So why am I an activist? Well first, let's discuss what the price of being an activist really is. The stress and potential conflict and even danger it entails. To begin with, living in this current paradigm and having the will and ability to walk your own path will have certain psychosocial implications, such as alienation from those you interact with, meaning that you will be made to feel different from everyone else, creating an immediate negative state of an imposed feeling of separation from the group due to the difference in worldview. This serves as a means of social control. Being social creatures, the propensity is to avoid being an outsider and be part of the tribe as it were. But when this group mind tendency is exploited for means of segregating and cutting out anyone who doesn't uphold the commonly held perceptions, that's when you get trouble. Disparity of communication meaning that the differences will adversely affect the success of most communications between yourself and the rest of society. Have you ever been in what seems like a regular social situation where conversation is flowing and, and you put your own two cents in as it were and it either goes right over their head or instantly causes an uncomfortable silence? Yeah, that is the signal of two differing frames of reference thus resulting in a lower success rate of communications in general. Retaliation from those around you, meaning that communicating to your fellow man and woman a train of thought that could change things for the better, can actually have a retaliatory effect where they impose physical, verbal or even non-verbal violence against you to defend against how your worldview threatens the stability of their own artificially created and imposed values. If there's one thing that established and unchangeable values hate more, it's emergence. It is like the antidote to the poison that is dogmatic thought, and it's great to know that our culture already has a defense protocol for such occasions. So why put yourself through that? Surely it sounds like a huge drag and it's better just to just keep your head down and get on with your work like everyone else, right? Okay, here's why. Financial fraud. The very inherent functioning of our entire global banking system is an inflationary, cancerous and insidious pyramid scheme that is centuries old and is guarded from examination as the invisible religion, the holy trinity of cash, card and code. It functions by committing fraud at every step in its processes. Perpetual inflation, debt creation and consolidation of currency, resources and power in the hands of the few can only lead to complete failure and collapse of the entire system itself. What I have just gesturally explained is the process of fractional reserve banking, compound interest and debt. And it is these horrors that lie at the very centre of the monetary market ethos, the nucleus of our financial system. And the hardest pill to swallow about this is that it has been in our faces all along and we never collectively realised. The illusion of money has been shrouded in obfuscation, meaning that it has been portrayed as so complex that the will to find out what it's about is overwhelmed and shut down disguising and hiding the immoral and destructive attributes while operating in plain sight is the mark of any institution that cares only for itself and uses populations for those ends inevitably leading to suffering. As a result, they are not deserving of our sustained support. Inefficiency. This is one of the main things that the system requires. And when it comes to everything from the infrastructure to the very products we consume, efficiency must be continually held back, because efficiency is inverse to the mechanics of profit. There are many examples of this. However, to give you one just off the top of my head, say you ran a company that manufactures and sells automobiles. Does it make sense to ensure that every vehicle you create has a clean propulsion system such as electric or even compressed air, that the materials used to construct the car itself are durable, strong and also recyclable, and also equipped with the technological capability to be self-driven? 
This technology has existed for decades now, by the way. That sounds like a good idea, so why don't we just use that approach for all cars manufactured and used? Well, let's factor into the equation first that you are a car company in a system based upon currency. You need to stick to the bottom line of profit and self-preservation. So in order to capitalize, as it were, on the situation, you can cut corners in regards to worksmanship, funding, and material quality so that whatever comes off your production line is already inherently flawed. So through the use of inefficient practice and materials, you have created a chain of repeat business for yourself. This is called planned and intrinsic obsolescence, and it is essential for profit to be accrued. This also has a knock-on effect, which while causing anywhere from minor inconvenience to death, such malfunctions create repeat business for other companies which are also created to service the problems inherent in the design and construction of cars such as the auto repair industry. If cars were made to be efficient, durable and as recyclable as possible, what need would there be for the service industry? And with the need for that industry gone, GDP would decrease and the system will be in big trouble. Waste in a sense, waste is a byproduct of inefficiency due to the requirements for technical obsolescence. It is the fact that far too much of the Earth's resources that we extract, refine and use for consumed products and goods end up in landfill sites, piling higher and higher. This mechanism of using up materials and dumping them in a virtually unusable form is indistinguishable from flesh-eating viruses such as necrotizing fasciitis, which literally consumes and kills the cells of the body. Now I completely accept that there are some resources that cannot be recycled and reused. However, just because they are present in our ecosystem doesn't mean they should be used in the way that we are currently using them. For instance, carbon is the most common element in this galaxy. Carbon dioxide is the gas that is exchanged between human beings and plant life alongside oxygen. Now what would the reversal of that process result in? Can human beings exist breathing CO2 and trees breathing oxygen? No. So why do we think we can upset the balance and think it's okay to extract oil, coal and natural gas from the geology and just keep burning it? Violence. Violence is a byproduct of living in this current paradigm. You see, because this system is not designed to allow for everyone to enjoy a high standard of living, there is inevitably a select percentage of the populace who will not have their life needs met at all, and those who have to acquire their life needs by means of begging and or slavery in order to receive tokens of debt to then use them to purchase resources and those people have a varying degree of success in this process. The resultant condition is something we know as scarcity. And within scarcity, we humans not only develop in potentially destructive and antisocial manners due to the psychosocial ramifications of not having our life needs met, but also coping mechanisms in order to deal with the scarcity and try to meet our needs in whatever way our experientially installed moral codes dictate. And as we have seen through history, those distorted values have proven to be highly destructive. War. Warfare is the orchestrated outgrowth of violence itself. It has been resorted to for many reasons, from simple ideological or religious differences to the forced acquisition, otherwise known as theft, of the resources of others. There is also another facet of war in our modern culture, the act of making money off of war itself. Whether it is in the form of funding both sides of a conflict, such as with the resources used during the Second World War, or whether it's the near total destruction of an area and the carrying out of construction projects to build military bases and pipelines such as with the Iraq and Afghanistan occupations, war, as Smedley D. Butler famously said, is a racket. Ignorance. Ignorance is now not so much perceived to be a vice 
but rather a virtue. We now live in a culture that would rather not know about certain things which are either outside the realm of conventional and materialistic schools of thought or directly oppose the established values, beliefs and understandings of the culture at any respective point in time. And the only thing that seemingly matters when it comes to whether any particular idea or piece of information is valid is whether the majority believe it. Anything outside of that is deemed as blasphemy against the social order, and considering the scope of the agreed set of acceptable data is incredibly narrow, it's inevitably that outside data must be rejected, for it threatens to force a jack into the gap and permanently rip it wide open. The culture's self-defense mechanism against this is not surprisingly the value that it is cool not to care. Unsustainability Inevitably, the mathematical reality of our current paradigm is one of an unsustainable model of infinite growth and infinite consumption on a planet of nearly finite resources. But this is not acknowledged in the larger scale because this growth is crucial to the system itself. The requirements of GDP dictates a never-ending growth and consumption model. This is why the politicians and economists are always talking about growth and consumption when it comes to their opinion about what will create prosperity and a recovery of the so-called economy. But it's utterly unsustainable. Imagine a doctor sitting you down and telling you that you have widespread cancer throughout your body. And in order for you to recover and be cured, we need to increase the growth of your tumours. This is why John McMurtry referred to capitalism in this light in his book The Cancer Stage of Capitalism because cancer is the only other thing that exists that behaves exactly like our current monetary market system. What I have just listed is just a very small number of all the issues that we face as a species. And you know what? Even if you joined some campaign or movement that promoted some social change, the currently dominant perspective which promotes a static condition of human thought may cause the inhibition or even prevention of a decent and sustainable world during your lifetime. But we do it anyway. We know that it is a possibility that none of what we do would achieve the goal while we're alive, so therefore we're not personally benefiting from the fruits of our labour, and we even recognise that this could all be in vain. But we do it anyway. Why? Because it is for the betterment of potential future generations. We currently exist in a state of avoidable suffering. It is not in our destiny to suffer and die purely because we listened to those who said it was impossible or against our human nature. We are better than that.